Welcome to the Strong Suit Podcast, where growing companies learn the right way to recruit rock stars. Each episode features one of the world's experts on recruiting the best talent to your company. Now, here's your host and five-time entrepreneur, Jeff Hyman. Hello, and welcome to the Strong Suit Podcast. This is episode 140, and I'm your host, Jeff Hyman. Every Tuesday and Thursday, I interview a world-class expert on talent and recruiting so that you can build a company filled with rock stars. You know, we talk a lot on this podcast about hiring and recruiting rock stars. The question then is, how do you get the most out of these rock stars that you've just hired? It's very tempting to just kind of let them go and let them do their work. Well, it doesn't work quite that easily. Stephen Lynch is our guest today, and he's the head of strategy and consulting at results.com. And he has studied this question inside and out. He gets unique insights into the day-to-day operations of thousands of growth companies around the world because he understands what really works and what doesn't work when it comes to business execution, how to set goals for your team, how to track their performance, even how to run effective meetings and hold them accountable. And in this 20-minute interview, Stephen's going to share his observations, how to get the most out of your staff, even if you've gone so far as to hire rock stars, which I'm sure that you have because you're a loyal listener to this podcast. So here we go. Ready, aim, hire. Okay, Stephen, hello, and thank you for joining us today. Hi, Jeff. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you for having me. I know you live in San Francisco, but I'm guessing from the accent, you're probably not a native. Uh, I'm a New Zealander by birth, uh, a Kiwi. I've I've lived in North America for the last uh, eight years, but you wouldn't know it from my accent. I love a good Kiwi. So let's uh, let's get into it. You know, I'm really glad you're on on the show today because we spend a lot of time, you know, we've done like 130 episodes or something, and many of them are on recruiting and how to attract the best talent to your company, how to find rock stars, interview them, assess them, et cetera. And I think, you know, Shimon, we, we've spent less time on how to get the most out of the rock stars that you hire. You can't just throw them in the pool and hope they swim, right? You need to actually, you know, do a few things right. And, and I guess performance management is probably the category name, right? Yes, yes. And so you're the expert. I'm told that you know this stuff inside and out. You've developed tools and software and all kinds of things. So over the next 20 minutes, we're going to focus on how do I get the most out of the rock stars that I've spent such a hard time finding and landing at my company. And now I actually need to, to, you know, to, to, to motivate them and lead them. So I guess the first place to start is, um, you know, maybe you can spend a few seconds on this, but how is managing and leading rock stars, top performers, different than managing and leading everybody else? In what ways is it different? Uh, well, first of all, in what ways is it similar? First of all, you've got to give everybody clarity around what good performance looks like. And for me, performance has two dimensions. There's, there's performance in terms of results. So what, what do good results look like, whether it's their metrics or their projects or their tasks, but also uh, there's the dimension of, of behaviours. What do good behaviours look like in terms, in terms of the core values that need to be exhibited by every person in every role? So you need to give everyone coming into a role clarity around good performance. You know, what, are the, what are the right behaviours? they need to exhibit and what are the results that they need to achieve in their roles. That needs to be a key part of the onboarding process. Absolutely. And, and provide that clarity up front, even, even before they join your company, they should know what they're getting into. Right. Okay, go ahead. And uh, well, I guess, you know, where I see many, many companies go wrong in this regard, and, and we work primarily with small to medium sized businesses, is that in terms of behaviours, they don't have good core values so that, that it's not clear to people coming in what sort of behaviours they need to exhibit in their roles. And when it comes to, to results, uh, when it comes to setting things like like metrics or, or some people call them key performance indicators, I tend to see uh, leaders do a poor job of, uh, of A, figuring out what to measure and B, figuring out what, what where do you where do you set those performance thresholds to, to, to motivate and engage your rock stars the most? So let's start there and really drill into it. Is there an optimal number of performance indicators, numbers, that each person in the organization should be held to? Is it 2, 5, 20? Does it matter? Um, <laughs> and, and then how do you go about setting uh, the appropriate level of goals that are a stretch but not a strain? <laughs> Yeah, in my experience, you know, around sort of anywhere between sort of three to six 
metrics or performance measures per person is probably about right. Any more than that, and, and you risk people losing focus. Uh, and when it comes to you know, uh, you know what to measure, I guess it's getting very clear about you know what are the outcomes or what are the results we're looking to achieve here, be it you know in the functional area or for the for the role specifically. Uh, so yes, results or outcomes are important. Absolutely, we need to measure them. That's what we're striving for at the end of the day. But if but if all of your measures have dollar signs in front of them, they're probably not the most powerful metrics you should be tracking. There should be you some know, so interim what, metrics before you get to dollars, right? Absolutely, yeah. So start with results. What are the results or, or outcomes we're looking for? But then ask yourself you know, two further questions. What actions or activities drive these results? And what effectiveness le- measures let us know how well these activities are being performed? And, right. and those two areas there, activity and effectiveness, are where the most powerful metrics uh, are usually to be found. And, and I find you probably want you know, one or two Outcome measures and 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 one or two activity and effectiveness measures, but no more than sort of six yep. measures total is so, about right. So I get activity right if I'm if I'm talking mm-hmm. about a sales rep, it's how many meetings per week or what have you. Well, give us an example yes. of what you mean by effectiveness. Would that be you know how many meetings go to the next stage or how many what your percentage close rate is or something? Correct. Yeah, conversion ratios uh, would would be common effectiveness so, measures. So I'm guessing the listener is pretty. A, is able to think about sales, marketing, folks in those roles. How about longer-term project, group project-based roles, like a software developer or some of those types of roles? What kind of interim measures can you, can you look at? And you, you've hit upon a key area there. Some roles are harder to quantify than others, and some roles, particularly creative roles, uh, very often it, 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 the way to manage performance is to closely manage that person's projects and tasks instead and to get very clear on, on first of all, yes, what outcomes are we looking for. Yeah. Where I see many uh, leaders go wrong is is in, in the scoping out of the project and in the due dates uh, for the project. Very important that uh, you, you do a good job of, of scoping out what is and what is not in scope right from the beginning so people know clearly where the finish line is and what is and is not included in that finish line. And also to set conservative due dates, just looking at thousands of teams working on their goals. Uh, in my experience, whatever due date you come up with, if you, if you double it, that'll probably be, cl- yeah. be closer to, to the reality. <laughs> right. And, and so I always say to, 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 to team leaders, you know, uh, whatever due date you put in, 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 in the dashboarding software, it, it's a conservative due date. And it's not a hope, it's a must. Yeah. Yes, we hope to get it done sooner, but the due date is a must. And that's what the team is counting on. And that's what you want to negotiate with the person. So that I'm clear, Stephen, are you saying that in the roles such as creative product development type of roles, that other than due date, it doesn't really make sense to have metrics and instead the leader's effort should be focused on project management as opposed to task and metrics management? Is it a different style of leadership for those roles? Yeah. Yeah, good question. I mean, I mean, there are some thought leaders who say every role should have a KPI or every role should have a metric. And in general, I agree with that principle. But but in, in my experience, some roles, as I said, are harder to quantify than others. And, and if you just uh, force yourself to have metrics for every person, sometimes you end up coming up with nonsense metrics that, that really don't engage the person or, or drive performance. Right. And for some roles, managing their projects and tasks is more important. So yes, there'll be a, an outcome that you're looking to achieve by, by, by a due date that you've scoped out thoroughly. Then it comes to actually managing closely that person's tasks are, are on a daily, weekly basis and make sure that they're hitting the key milestones along the way and coaching and supporting them right. to make sure that they do. One of the most important and frustrating areas to a lot of people is can, is hitting their numbers, right? Their sales numbers. So yes. let's, let's spend a few minutes on that. Uh, it's top of the P&L. It's first and foremost in a lot of leaders' minds. Uh, if you're missing the numbers, life tends to get pretty miserable, especially with regard to investors. So yes. what have you found in your studies and your, and your software development around uh, results and how to set goals that are appropriate stretch goals in the sales function? How do I go about doing that? Do I task each person with growing the business by X percent per year or some other way? Yeah, no, again, a really, a really good question. And, and once you've figured out what to measure, i.e. these are the outcomes we're looking for, these are the activity and effectiveness measures that drive these outcomes, uh, we, you know, we use you know, the, the standard traffic-like color coding to, to, to grade performance, green being good job, well done, 
keep it up. Yellow, oh, not happy yet. We're keeping a close eye on this. Red, no, that's unacceptable and we need to discuss this and provide you with, with coaching and support. And where I see many leaders come unstuck is, is that they tend to set the green threshold performance, the good level of performance too high. And I understand why they want to do that because they're optimists by nature and they want they want to grow and they and they want to, to, to maximize performance. But what I see them typically do is that they set the, the green threshold of performance so high that even their rock stars fail to meet this performance so a standards. certain percentage of people should be hitting the green so that you know that these numbers are somewhat realistic. Yeah, yeah. And, and my recommendation is that your, your rock stars, you know, if you, if you, the, the, the way you want to set that threshold is, is that your rock stars should be hitting that green threshold nine times out of 10. So 90% of the time, the rock stars should hit or exceed that green threshold. Now, your slackers won't necessarily be hitting that threshold, but your rock stars absolutely should. because it lets them know at the end of the day, at the end of the week, at the end of the month, hey, I'm a rock star, I'm doing a good job. Yeah, got it. And if they're consistently hitting it, perhaps you've set it a bit too low, you can then reassess it the next time around. But what I hear you saying is if you start too high and even your best people are missing, you know, five out of 10 or eight out of 10, they're going to get demotivated. They're going to, they're not going to be earning sufficient compensation and they're going to look elsewhere and the whole formula That's- starts to break down, right? Yeah, and, and they see their performance visualized on a software dashboard and, and they can see that they're not in the green. And, and it, rather than motivate people, in our experience, we see that it actually demotivates people, yeah. particularly good people. They, they look at it and they think, well, I'm a, I'm a failure. Yeah. I thought I was good, but, but this, this, this tool is showing me that I'm failing. And, right. and, rather than, and if they don't think they can achieve that green threshold with, with a reasonable amount of effort, this is your good people, then they, then they quickly become demotivated and they think, well, well, what's the use? And everyone else on the team thinks, well, even, even Rockstar can't achieve this level of performance, so How what hope have we? Yeah. Or I'm, you know, I'm a candidate and I'm interviewing and I'm sophisticated enough to ask what percent of people hit their numbers and if the answer is 20%, I may not have an interest in joining. Yes, yes. So let's talk about another controversial point, Stephen, which is open books versus closed books. And I don't mean in terms of compensation. I mean in terms of sales reps and their performance. Yes. All else being equal, have you found it makes sense to show everyone's numbers so people can see where they fall in a forced ranking or should numbers not be shared? Uh, and, and my experience and in my opinion, yes, they should be shared. Now, you may not share some financial information with all employees, but but in terms of sharing performance information, yes, we absolutely believe in, in doing so. And I always talk to, to, to leaders who are unsure about that, you know, uh, about this concept of, of, of running your, your, your teams transparently. And, uh, and I share this example from, from, from Navy pilots who, who land on aircraft carriers. And every time a Navy pilot lands on an aircraft carrier, they get their landing graded for safety and technique and, and, and color-coded green, yellow, red. And it, they go below board and, and every pilot sees how their landings score compared to all the other pilots. And, right. and any Navy pilot will tell you no one wants to have red or, or yellow marks next to their name and no, one's, no yeah, one wants sure. to be at the bottom of that dashboard sure. either. So even without their commanding officer saying anything, they'll be thinking, well, what do I need to do to improve my technique here? Who do I need to ask? You know, and and even without their, their manager or leader saying anything, they'll be looking to ways to improve their performance. So there is there are benefits from transparency, yes. That's right. I think there's two really important points, and I'd like to know if you agree or disagree. Number one is rock stars really respond well to this because they are inherently competitive. They are achievement-oriented and want to do well. So I hear some leaders very worried about rocking the boat or how it might affect the culture and I tell them what they're doing is actually optimizing for the underperformance as opposed to getting people to aspire to do better, which incents and rewards your rock stars. And if other people don't like it, they can choose to leave. Is that, Would you agree with that? Yes, yes. And, 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 uh, and invariably, there will be you know, uh, one or more underperformers on the team. And, yes. and yes, they, they may require coaching and support yep. you know, if they have the potential to be a, a, no. you know, a, no. a top performer. Uh, unfortunately, there will be some that, that uh, you know, it's just not the right role or, or, or not the right organization for them, and, and, it, and it helps expedite those decisions. The second point, which is equally important, is that you have to normalize the data. A lot of companies will, just in a rush to throw out data, how do you do last month? They'll, they'll stack rank everyone and show everyone's numbers, but they have different sized territories. And so the person... Ah who has the smallest territory might be listed last, he might actually be highest percent to goal. And so you really need to find a way to normalize the data, you know, percent to goal or 
something, right? That yes. that kind of uh, takes away the size differences of sales territories or customers, that type of thing. I certainly experienced that as a young young salesman earlier in my career, so I can empathise with with that one absolutely. Yeah, and I've also not I've also typically not shared the numbers for someone that's still in the ramp up phase. So if it's a you know medium sales cycle, I may say for the first six months we don't share that data for those new newer people. And then once you hit the six month mark, you're going to start appearing on on the board. And, and another workaround that that we do just you know is is to actually just set them lower thresholds and 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 ramp them up uh, you know accordingly. So yeah. people know that yes, yeah. new person's thresholds are lower, but you know it's because of their 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 time on the job. So what's the next step after we've figured out what KPIs to put in place three to six, and we figured out the appropriate levels of green, yellow, red? What mm-hmm. comes next, Eden? Um, I, I guess one of the mistakes I made early in my management career is that I, I, I rewarded my rock stars by leaving them alone. And, and I've since learned that this was, a, this was a big mistake. I thought, well, they're doing a good job. I don't need to say anything. And I spent most of my time trying to fix or improve my poor performers. And, and I lost some good people. And, 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 and during exit interviews, uh, it, it was shared with me that they, they felt I didn't, didn't care about them and their development. And, and that really stung. I mean, of course I cared. I just, I just had a bad way of showing it. I, yeah. I, I, I thought, I thought, I'll leave these people alone. They're doing great. Right. Uh, whereas, up, I, right? <laughs> whereas I realized they actually want just as much, if not more, of my time and attention and coaching and, and mentoring. And, and uh, I learned that one the hard way. And uh, I, I guess what I've seen at the, the most, uh, our most effective team leaders, our most effective managers do when, when they use the results.com software to manage their teams is, is they run very effective meetings to, to, to coach and discuss performance with their people as a team, but most especially one-on-one. They meet one-on-one with each of their direct reports each and every week and provide them with, with appropriate coaching depending on how well they are performing. And that one-on-one meeting, it's, if, I always say to, 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 to leaders, if you only did one thing differently from talking to me, it would be to have that regular one-on-one and, and carve it in stone with, with each of your direct reports to, to coach and mentor them on their performance. Have you developed a framework or some guideline that tells us what percentage of our time we should be spending with our top performers or something like that? <sighs> I'm not sure exactly, but for, but to me, if you're not having a, a 30 minute one on one with with each of your team members at at a minimum, you're not meeting with them frequently enough. Now there'll be other meetings that you'll be involved uh, with them in, in a team based setting, but but one on one, you should carve out 30 minutes for, for each person on your team, and if that's the most important use of your time as a team leader. Yep, agree. So, someone's missing their numbers, or getting a lot of yellows and reds on their dashboard, whatever metrics we're choosing to use. The inevitable question is, how long do I wait before I remove them? I, I think <laughs> most, people, most people would agree people wait too long. Um, yes. give, give us your take on this because it really doesn't make sense to set metrics and measure and track if we're not going to do something about it and make them actionable. Um, so what have you, what have you learned? Yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, a firing decision should should never be a surprise, and 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 if it is, then then that, that that's the manager's failing. Yep. Uh, uh, and and performance should be discussed you know, real time, and 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 at, and at least every week, as per the the, the, the meeting frequency I, I mentioned earlier. And uh, I've I've got a, a saying that that I share with clients is is you've got to you've got to weed the garden each and every week. Just get out there and and weed the garden. Pull out the weeds when when they're small and there's not too many because if you do that, it's it's easy to keep your garden looking good. Yep. But if you don't pull out those weeds, within a few weeks, they'll start taking over your garden and, and choking the growth of your plants. And so each and every week, just, just weed the garden. Anytime you see a, a metric that's not green or a project or task that's overdue, you, you go through a, 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 I've got this three question sequence that, that, I, that I, I, I teach clients. Wait, and and the write, first I'm question. I'm going to write this down. Wait a sec. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. The first question, whenever you see a weed, which is you know, a goal that's underperforming, you just say, oh, you know, what's happening here? And you, and you ask it in a very friendly, non threatening manner. It's just, what's happening here? Now, now there may be a perfectly valid reason why something is, is, is underperforming uh, or, or a goal is not where it needs to be right now, but let's make sure we understand what that reason is. So the first question is, oh, what's happening here? The second question, okay, so what one thing could we do this week to improve this? And yeah. you'd, you'd discuss with the person, hope, let them come up with suggestions first of all, and then you add yours, but agree at least one action. Now, there may be more than one, but agree at least one action that can be taken this week to improve the situation. Yeah. And the third question is, 
what help or support do you need from me? You need to let the person know that you're on their side and and you have you know, their best interests at heart and, and you only win if they win. So you, you, you want to coach and support and help them to achieve these agreed yep. outcomes. So that same three-question sequence needs to happen each and every week whenever you observe any project metric or task that, that's not where it needs to be. So it's, you what's happening here. It's going to hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just get out there every every week and weed the garden. Just pull out those weeds when they're small and, and they're not too many. And, and, and I'm not going to let you off the hook on this question. How long do I give the weed before I decide it needs to be removed? Is it three months? My, six months? My, 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 own, my own personal recommendation is the quarter. If they, if they can't get their act together within the quarter, then you, you need to make that call then. And it shouldn't be a surprise to the person if you've been discussing these weeds each and every week with them. Yep, I would agree with you. And I think even even three months is on the longer side. A lot of people will give it six months, two years, forever. And it is one of the easiest ways to really disillusion your top performers is to leave those bottom performers as is kind of drags down the results of the whole organization and it really pisses off your rock stars. Yeah, and, and I, I see it happen. Let's just say we've got a, a poor performer named Bob and everyone can see that Bob's underperforming, his, his goals are red, but but they say, well, but, but nothing happens to Bob, so perhaps being in the red's okay. Why am, why, am, why am I working so hard? One last topic before we wrap up, Stephen, is something that you mentioned at the very beginning of the discussion, which was you're not only looking at their performance and their metrics, you're also looking at their behaviors, which goes to values and culture, what's acceptable in the company, what's not. How the heck are we measuring that? And are, are, we, are we treating that the same way that we treat goals? I just, I, I understand it conceptually, but how do you bring that to life for us? Yeah. And, uh, one of the, the, the most powerful ways I've seen to, to bring core values to life is, is every, when you have a team meeting, everyone on the team must share a story of where they observed someone else on the team demonstrating one of the core values behaviours in the previous week. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that's a way of making sure that you, you people know and, and, and you reinforce uh, uh, what, what the core values are, but also share stories each and every week of, of people demonstrating those behaviours and, and make them feel like the heroes they are and the role models for your culture that they are. And you'll soon, I guess, get a, a collection of stories and you'll see who is demonstrating these behaviours over time and who who doesn't get mentioned much over time. Uh, and uh, you, you can coach uh, those people accordingly. Is it safe to say that you cannot, uh, you can coach performance on metrics and activity, but if someone turns out to be just the wrong culture fit, you're just wasting your time by trying to change their behaviours? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I like to give people a chance. I like to say, hey, one of our core values is, is X. And what I saw last week, I, I don't think was it was a great example of demonstrating that behavior and to discuss how they, 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 they could modify their behaviors and to give them the opportunity to do so. But I agree, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's harder to, to change who someone fundamentally is in terms of their behaviors. I like to give them a chance, but, uh, you know, uh, ultimately that they, they will will deselect themselves yeah. if, they're, if they're unable to uh, adhere to, to those core values. More often than not, I think people find that it's largely not a great use of time if, if they realize they've just made a bad hire when it comes to culture fit. Uh, just, you know, call it a day and it can be respectful and the hiring manager should own it, right? We both agreed that this was a fit and we were both wrong. And, and I've seen it it's really powerful when when the when the manager actually shares with the team why why Bob left. Yeah. It was because one of our core values is X, and and Bob was not uh, able to demonstrate that you know in the way we wanted to see it demonstrated, so that people can see ah core values are important. They're not just words on a wall. Yeah. We yeah. need to demonstrate these things. Stephen, this is great. How can people learn more about your product, which is a phenomenal product to to enable all these things? And then how can they get in touch with you? Uh, Results.com is the name of the company, so the URL is, is easy, easy to remember. It's, it's, it's performance management software, productivity software for small to medium-sized businesses. If you want to get in touch with me, uh, stephenlynch.net. That's S-T-E-P-H-E-N-L-Y-N-C-H.net. Great. And this is a, I assume this is a, a SaaS kind of software platform that I use with my people, so we're all tracking everything and staying on the same page. Correct. It's, it's to, to capture your strategy and drive the execution of your strategy and help you run more effective meetings with your team to, to discuss and coach performance. That's great. I encourage people to take a look at it because if nothing else, it really kind of forces the discipline of ensuring that everyone is aligned and has metrics and that we see visually how we're doing. It really 
takes this soft and squishy leadership piece and makes it more objective. I, I congratulate you on that, Stephen. Thank you, Jeff. Great. Well, thanks for the time and uh, keep in touch. That's all for this episode of the Strong Suit Podcast. The next step is to head to strongsuit.com where you can join our free live webinar. You'll learn the proven method for recruiting rock stars to your company. If you liked what you heard today, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and write us a five-star review on iTunes. This is the Strong Suit Podcast, where we show you how to recruit rock stars.